Hey everybody, welcome to Latin 2. I'm Bob Smith. I'll be your instructor again for Latin this semester. And we're going to pick up where we left off last time. And we're going to start here in chapter 11. So we'll go from 11 all the way up through chapter 20. So again, we're using Wheelock's Latin grammar. So let's take a look at this chapter. Uh, we're going to be finally introduced to personal pronouns in Latin. Uh, just like in English, personal pronouns are used in place of a noun to indicate a person from the speaker's point of view. So in English, we have first-person personal pronouns like I and we. So they correspond to the Latin ego and nos. And we'll see both of those are going to decline, just like any other noun. Uh, Second-person personal pronouns. In English, you. So sometimes it's kind of hard to tell is it one person or many people. So just like before in Latin, we'll see it's got separate forms. So it'll be more apparent. Uh, third person personal pronouns. In English, he, she, or it. In the plural, they. In Latin, it's the uh, irregulars, is, a, a, it, which of course will decline to. And we'll take a look at those forms here in a second. So far, we haven't seen very much of these personal pronouns. As we've studied Latin, mainly because they're already contained in the ending of the verb as far as the subject is concerned. So we don't necessarily need to have a separate personal pronoun. You know, we can say amo, I love. The O indicates that it's first person singular. We've seen them as direct objects, though, these personal pronouns. Amo te, I love you. So we have seen them, we just really haven't thought about them too much. So, but as far as the nominative cases, we really haven't seen them yet. So let's take a look at these things. How they decline. Again, it's irregular. It's coming one of those things you're going to have to memorize. Uh, but you're probably pretty used to that so far in Latin. So let's look at these first person personal pronouns. There are separate singular and plural forms. So in the singular, we have ego, I. The genitive would be mei, of me. Dative singular, mihi, to or for me. Accusative, may which just means me. We've seen that one before. And ablative, also may, by, with, or from me. When we go to the plural, we have nos, we. Then genitive plural has potentially two different forms. Sometimes you see it as nostrum and sometimes as nostri, uh, both translated of us, just like in English. Dative plural, nobis, to or for us. Accusative plural, nos, us, and then nobis again, by, with, or from us, for the ablative plural. So, ego, mei, mihi, mei, mei, singular. Then plural, nos, nostrum, nostri, nobis, nos, nobis. Again, one of those things you just have to memorize. Let's take a look at the second person personal pronouns. So, if you've taken Spanish or Italian, these are going to look very familiar. So, second person, we have separate, singular, and plural, which makes it a little bit easier to tell the difference. So, nominative singular, to, you. Genitive would be tui, of you. Dative, singular, tibi, to or for you. Accusative, singular, te, you. And ablative, singular, also te, by, with, or from you. When we move to the plurals, you see we have totally separate forms. Wos, you. And then again in the genitive, we have those two potential forms. Westrum, westry. Uh, both can be translated of you. Then wobis, two or for you. Accusative plural, wos, you. And ablative plural, wobis, by, with, or from you. So you can see... Where you really couldn't tell in English if it was singular or plural. You can definitely tell here in Latin. So to go back over them again, tu, tui, tibi, te, te, singular. Plural, wos, westrum, or westri, wobis, wos, wobis. So remember in Latin that V is pronounced like a W. They don't have separate forms for those two. When we get to the third person personal pronouns, you know, you should be getting pretty good at memorizing things. And here's another instance where really the only way to, to learn this part is just to memorize it and kind of commit it to your 
repertoire of Latin so far. Since it's third person, it has to have separate, separate masculine, feminine, and neuter forms, singular and plural. So there's a whole host here. The good news is there's a lot of repetition. Genitive and dative singular are identical, no matter what the gender is. So let's take a look at this. So he would just be is, I-S. It can also be a little bit of a, a word kind of like hick or elay was. You could say this man. So it's kind of a weaker form of that. Genitive aeus of him or his. Dative singular ae. Accusative singular am, him. And then ablative singular ao, by, with, or from him. So those would be the masculine forms. Is, aeus, ae, am, ao. Go to the feminine, we have ea, again, aeus, ae, aam, ea. And then the neuter forms id, aeus, ae, id, ao. So it's very common as we uh, memorize these things to do them kind of horizontally instead of doing them up and down. So a good way to commit them to memory would be that way. We would say, is ea id, aeus, aeus, aeus. A E A E A E. That way you can see the repetition there. A M A M Id A O A A A O. And that's just half of it. So those are just the singular forms masculine, feminine, and neuter. When we go to the plural, again, separate forms, a little bit easier to memorize because they're a little bit more regular. So we go through the nominative masculine, feminine, and neuter. A E, sometimes E E, A I. A, so they, masculine, they, feminine, or they, neuter. When we start to talk about groups of people, by the way, uh, if it's an all-male group, we refer to it as if it's male. If it's an all-female group, we refer to it as if it's female. If it's a mixed gender group, so it could be a million females and one male, it makes the whole thing masculine. So a little bit of sexism there in Latin. So just something to keep in mind. So let's go back through these again. A E A A A A. Genitive plural. A O R M A R M A O R M of them. Dative plural. A E S A E S A E S. So the good news there is there's a lot of repetition. Accusative plural. A O S A O S A A. And then ablative plural. A E S A E S A E S. So some of these endings should look familiar because we've seen them before. But again, one of those things that's really just the, the easiest way is just to commit it to memory. So how are we getting to use these? And why haven't we seen these pronouns so far? Well, pronouns like nouns can be subjects. They can be direct, indirect objects. They can be objects of the prepositions and things like that. So let's look at some examples here and see how we're, we're kind of using it a little bit for emphasis. You know, we can say, Ego tibi libros dabo. I shall give the books to you. So we could throw that ego off the front of that, and we still have the same sentence, but having it there gives it a little bit more uh, force behind it. Ego ae libros dabo. I shall give the books to him. Or I shall give the books to her. Tu me non copies. You will not capture me. So again, a little bit more emphasis on the subject of the verb. Id, a e id ad nos mitent. They will send this thing to us. So, just a little bit more force. Os eos non capietis. You will not seize them. A i a ad te mitent. They will send them to you. So, again, we could throw those nominative forms out and it would mean the same thing, but it gives a little bit more force. So the Romans only use the nominatives of the pronouns when they want to emphasize the subject. So, for example, so kind of have a little simple sentence here. Ae spicunii dabo. I shall give them money. Well, we could throw that personal pronoun on there. Ego. Ego a spicunii dabo. I shall give them money. And then we might say, quid tu dabis. What will you give? Again, those pronouns aren't necessarily 
you know, super important there, but it changes the emphasis a little bit. You know, you're saying, well, I'm going to do this. What are you going to do? So again, just something to give it a little bit more emphasis. Let's look at some of the vocabulary from the chapter. So I'm trying to make these uh, new lectures kind of flow with this new book. They've uh, reformatted it and they've tried to make it look like it's you know written in ancient Latin. Uh, so we have the vocabulary. So remember in Latin they don't have separate uh, V's and U's either. So everything looks like a V even if it's a vowel in our case. So that's why it looks like it's misspelled, but it's not. Vocabula. So some of these are pretty apparent because they look a lot like the English cognates. But let's go through our vocabulary list. Caput. Capitus. So that's a neuter noun that means head. You know, like your head, your caput. Uh, it can also mean a leader. It can also mean the beginning. Uh, like a chapter heading. So you see that very commonly in books as far as, you know, when the chapters start. So caput capitus. Consul. Consulus. So that would just be a, a consul. One of these people that, you know, work in the government. Here's a strange one because it just gives us all the forms because the whole thing's irregular and it only has singular forms. Nemo, like Captain Nemo. Uh, Nemo, nullius is the genitive singular. Nemini, dative. Nemonem, accusative. And then ablative is either nullo or nulla, depending on whether it's masculine or feminine. And that just means no one or nobody. So Captain Nemo, think about it, uh, would be Captain Nobody. So it's just kind of a play on words that Jules Verne had. Then we have our personal pronouns, ago, mei, which we saw in the chapter. Which, like I said, the easiest way is just to memorize those. Uh, tu, tui, you, both singular and plural. Is a id, he, she, or it. And that's where we get these little abbreviations like, you know, ie, which in Latin means it is, that is. Then we have this kind of combination of is a a ed plus a little ending. Edem, aadem, edem. Which means basically the same. You know, the same man, the same woman, the same thing. So you'll see that in the chapter and I believe it appears in the homework where I have you uh, decline that whole thing out. So edem, aadem, edem. Here we're going to have a vocabulary where it looks pretty familiar. So we've seen this before as a noun, but now it's an adjective. Amicus, amica, amicum. So here in this case it doesn't just mean friend. If it modifies a noun it means friendly. So if somebody's amicable, they're friendly. So amicus, amica, amicum. Same thing with this next one, carus. Carus, cara, carum. Means dear. You know, something you hold dear, something you uh, cherish. Now we're going to have this little conjunction. You've probably seen it before. Quod. Uh, in this case, it, just, it can just mean because. This next little combination, neque. Neque usually is followed by neck. It's a conjunction and, and it joins two uh, phrases together. And it's almost always translated as and not and nor or neither nor. So you'll see it neque neck or neque neque or neck neck. So they all translate pretty much the same. Neither this nor that. So keep an eye out for that. I think one of those will appear in your uh, sententiae and tiquai too. And we have another conjunction, autem. Remember in Latin they have a tendency to put those conjunctions not at the beginning where we would put them. Because autem means however or moreover. Uh, they would put it right after the first word. So post positive. That's what that means. It doesn't come first, it comes second. So more however, moreover. Moreover. Now we're going to have the adverb bene. So it's the adverb form of bonus, which means good. So it's that thing we see in English a lot where we're not sure if we're supposed to say good or well, you know, how are you doing? I'm doing good. I feel good. Uh, if it's an adverb we should translate it as well. So it's one of those things we really are never quite sure how to do in English sometimes. So bene can be well, satisfactorily, quite. So hopefully that will make it a little bit easier to 
pick and choose which one you're supposed to use in English. An adverb, etiam, which I believe we've seen before in some translations, etiam means even or also. Then we're going to get some verbs, just like always in these chapters. Uh, here's a third conjugation verb, intelligo, intelligere, intellexi, intellectum. And fortunately for this one, you can almost guess what that one means. That means to understand, where we get our word intelligent from. Next we have mito, mito, mitere, misi, misum, which means to send or to let go. Then we have a fourth conjugation verb, sentio, sentire, sensi, sensum. Again, an easy one to memorize because it means to feel, to perceive, to think, to experience, you know, to sense something. So you can see we get a lot of our English uh, words by way of French from Latin. So a lot of these things are going to look pretty familiar to us. Well, let's look at these sententiae and tequi. Just like always, just like last semester, uh, I'll read them so you can get an idea of what they maybe should sound like. Um, Remember, pronunciation varies. Don't stress it too much. I definitely have an oaky accent whenever I uh, try and translate these, but it gives us a good idea of what they might have sounded like, you know, if they were from Oklahoma. Um, but anyway, let's go through the sententiae and tequi, and then we'll wrap this chapter up. So, our first sentence, and it's one of the differences between this and the previous version. They don't number the sentences for some reason. So, the first sentence, Virtus tua me amicum. Tibi facet. So, where does tua me amicum tibi facet? The next sentence, id solum est carum mihi. Id solum est carum mihi. And there's a little note that goes with it. Sed valeis bene est. Ego valeo. So, there's that first person personal pronoun. Think about that as you translate it. Bene est mihi. Quod tibi bene est. So here's our next one. Bene est mihi, quod tibe bene est. So as you go through there, make note where you see these personal pronouns and think about how they're being used in the sentence. Here's another little quote from Terence. Wale. Hopefully you remember what that means. Wale. Et tu bene wale. So you see this is an idiom. You'll have to kind of play with the translation on this one. Next one. Quid he de ne start over again. Quid he de te nunc sentient. Quid he de te nunc sentient. Again, there's those personal pronouns. Think about that as you translate it. Omnes idem sentient. Omnes idem sentient. The next one, a little bit longer one. Quid deo neminem. Ex eis hodie, excuse me, video neminem ex eis hodie, essay amicum tibi. So, kind of a mouthful, just like I uh, stumbled over it. So, think about this. And it says here in this little note the subject of an infinitive is regularly in the accusative, hence neminem. So, add this to your list of accusative uh, case uses. Uh, see chapter 25. So, they tend to do this a lot in the book. I'll tell you to remember this in. A dozen or so chapters. So, Wideo Neminem ex eis hodie esse amicum tibi. This text one is kind of an interesting sentence. Uh, Homines widere caput cicerones in rostris poterot. Homines widere caput cicerones in rostris poterot. So, there's an interesting little note that goes with this one. Uh, it says it's a quote from Livy. Uh, Antony prescribed Cicero, um, which is not a good thing because he basically had him put to death. Antony prescribed Cicero and had the great orator's head cut off and displayed on the rostra. What the rostra is, it's a speaking platform in the Roman Forum. And it gets its name from the way it's shaped. A rostrum or rostra are beaks, like the beak of a bird, and they called the front part of a ship a rostrum. So the speaking flat platform was what they're referring to here. They would take the 
uh, the pieces off the front of ships and stick it on this to kind of show what they had conquered. So it's one of those interesting things that the, the Romans, you know, where they get these weird names for things. So think about this. You know, Cicero's been sentenced to death and he gets his head cut off. So that's what we're talking about in this sentence. Homines would carry caput cicerones in rostris potimont. Next one, a quote from Horace: "Non omnes eadem amant aut aistam aistem capitates studiaque habent." See, even I stumble over these. "Non omnes eadem amant aut aistem capitates studiaque habent." So again, as you're doing these, do your best on them. Don't stress too much. Next to the last one. Here's one of those neck neck ones. Neck tecum possum vivere, neck sine te. Neck tecum possum vivere, neck sine te. So as you translate it, keep in mind it's got that neck neck thing. So think about how you translate that. Then finally, last but not least, virus amicus es alter idem. Verus amicus est alter idem. So, a quote from Cicero. It says, explain how alter idem can mean a second self. So, that's a little hint there. So, again, do your best on these. Remember, translate the verbs first. Uh, go back and look for the subjects. Then do the objects. And it should be a little bit easier if you kind of work at them systematically. Remember, just like before, there is no word order in Latin. The endings tell you how the words are used. So don't rely too much on the word order. Again, we, we put things in certain order for emphasis, uh, but it doesn't really mean a whole lot. The main thing, look at those endings and put them in the right place. So I hope you enjoyed your brief couple days break from Latin. We're going to throw ourselves right back in and start here in Chapter 11. So hopefully here pretty quickly I will have Chapter 12's video posted. And we'll get right back into it. Again, if you have any questions, feel free to email me, uh, latinbob at yahoo.com. And I will see you again here in Chapter 12, hopefully very shortly.